Good evening. I'm Mike Knetter, and welcome to the UW Now live stream series, where we bring you experts from the UW community talking about various aspects of the COVID-19 crisis. Tonight, we'll be talking about the soon-to-begin Badger football season amid the pandemic. The Badgers will take on Illinois to open the season in a real live game Friday night. And it's also virtual homecoming to boot, with many events planned, including a scavenger hunt with Bucky and a Friday night fifth quarter. Tomorrow we kick off our virtual fill the hill. For every gift, a virtual plastic flamingo will go up on what I assume will be a virtual Bascom Hill. Funds raised go toward the university's most critical needs and I can assure you that this year there are many. Your support is greatly appreciated. For our show tonight, we have Chris McIntosh, Deputy Athletic Director, who happened to be an All-American Offensive Tackle and Outland Trophy finalist for the Wisconsin Badgers, and Matt LaPay, Wisconsin's favorite sportscaster and voice of the Badgers football and men's basketball teams. Thanks for joining us, gentlemen. And we'll kick things off tonight with Chris McIntosh. Mac captained the Badgers back-to-back -back Big Ten and Rose Bowl championships in 1998 and 1999 and started 50 straight games during his college career. He was a first-round draft choice of the Seattle Seahawks in 2000, where he played for several seasons. He returned to Wisconsin to join the athletic department, where he has ascended to deputy athletic director. Mac, it's great to see you, and we look forward to hearing about what has been happening behind the scenes as the Badgers prepare for this most unusual season. Thanks for being here tonight. Thanks, Mike. Happy to be here. Um, happy to talk about live football. Um, it's been quite a journey, and um, you know, football in a COVID era right now is uh, it, it's a it's a it's a coin flip. There is one aspect of football during a COVID era that's like any other: blocking and tackling. And uh, we're excited that our our student athletes can. Uh, take the field and they've been practicing now for quite some time and take the field Friday night and, and basically get a reprieve from COVID, uh, something that I'm sure we can all relate to. Um, there are many aspects of football during COVID that resemble, that don't resemble what football usually is. And um, I think, you know, the overwhelming message uh, that I'd like to share with our audience tonight is we have a lot to be proud of um, as alum of this great university and as supporters of, of our program and, and our football team in particular. Uh, these young men, uh, led by a great coaching staff uh, and a fantastic head coach and Coach Chris, have uh, been through quite a journey um, starting this spring, like all of us, the second week of March, when uh, COVID uh, prevented us from being able to participate in spring football. Um, the uncertainty between then and when the season was scheduled to begin uh, for them uh, the first week of August until we get to now uh, game time has been incredible and it's been quite an emotional roller coaster for everybody involved. Um, I think we can be proud of the way our student athletes uh, have handled this. Um, they've been resilient. Uh, young people, young people are far more resilient than than we tend to be ourselves. Uh, they've been resilient. They've been strong. They've, they've been able to roll with it. Uh, there have been moments in time that have been very tough for them. In August, uh, at the cusp of what we thought was a season that was about to begin, uh, a period of time in which it didn't look very bright. And, and now when it's uh, as optimistic as ever that we'll be able to play a season, we feel really good about our, our approach. I'd also add uh, there's a lot to be proud of as an alum of our coaching staff and the leadership we have in Coach Christ. Uh, his uh, steadfast approach to this and um, his priority in keeping our players healthy and safe uh, hasn't wavered. Um, one of the factors that led to the postponement of the season in August was that we weren't able to answer the questions that needed to be answered. We weren't able to feel confident that we could keep our players safe. And um, like we can all relate to, I suppose, advancements and changes uh, have come about uh, in rapid fashion. And uh, since that time, uh, there have been advancements uh, and resources made available to us that 
I think allow us to feel confident about our ability to play, uh, allow us to feel confident, confident about our ability for our student athletes to come into our, our uh, facilities on a day-to-day -day basis and practice, and uh, that the chances of transmission of COVID are uh, almost eliminated given our daily uh, rapid turnaround testing capabilities. And I'm sure I can talk more about that later on uh, when we get to questions, but I just, uh, I would instill in you uh, it's a week to celebrate. As Mike mentioned, it's virtual homecoming. Uh, it's a week to celebrate football and, and a break from uh, the tiring uh, journey that this has been. And so it's a celebration for us in the athletic department. And uh, first and foremost, uh, we couldn't be more happy for our student athletes who have been on such a journey and, and get to celebrate on Friday night uh, with a kick against Illinois and perhaps a little redemption uh, against the team that um, – got one on us last year. So I'd encourage you uh, to sit back and enjoy uh, the game on Friday night. Um, it'll be very different around uh, Madison and around campus. Um, it's It'll be surreal. Uh, it'll be quiet. And uh, frankly, that's what we hope it to be on Friday. Um, we're cooperating with and par partnering with public health officials here in Madison. And, and um, we're trying to keep everybody healthy and, and um, for all kinds of reasons, uh, the first the first reason which we've stated from the beginning is we play a role in that. Um, but also, um, you know, minimizing the, the transmission of COVID uh, gives us the best chance of playing the next week and the next week and the next week. And we've got strict tolerances in terms of uh, our metrics that we need to meet, our team needs to meet to be able to compete. And it's our hope uh, throughout the Big Ten that we'll be able to do that. So uh, we're excited. We're pumped up. We're ready to go on Friday night, and there's a lot to be excited about. Uh, and we as alum have a lot to be proud of. So thank you. Great message, Chris. Thank you. And uh, gosh, for once, I'm going to be excited to stay in on Friday night during COVID. Thank you <laughs> for making that possible. Uh, I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions about the team and and kind of what that preparation has looked like. and you know, how, I, I know for a while we had some cases uh, on the team maybe about a month ago, but uh, love to get an update on anything there. Uh, our next guest is Matt LaPay, uh, who really needs no introduction. Um, you know, other than the birth defect of having been born in Ohio, which led him to go to Ohio State, uh, Matt has been known as the voice of the Badgers since 1988. He hosts the weekly Badger Sports Report, show and is a seven-time winner of the Wisconsin Sportscaster of the Year Award, apparently sometimes they feel compelled to award it to someone with a different name. But uh, Matt, it is great to have you here. I am looking forward to hearing your voice calling the game uh, more than any, any year past. Uh, you're going to play a pretty important role this year for all of us that might normally be watching from inside Camp Randall. So uh, anxious to hear your comments. Thanks for being here. Thank you, thank you, Mike. Yeah, I, uh, my apologies in advance for having attended Ohio State. Born a Buckeye, but a Badger for life. My, matter of fact, my wife is a faculty associate here at the University of Wisconsin in the School of Human Ecology. So we are we are Badgers through and through. So no Buckeye questions, please. Um, I would echo a little bit what Chris was saying. I, when the initial decision was was made to postpone, I felt terrible for the players. And then when the green light was given to play a season starting here this week, I was thrilled for these guys, for all of them, because in talking with a lot of them here over the last few weeks, they they had periods of doubt whether there would be a season or whether a season in January, February, and March was going to be practical for them. Um, they don't have to worry about that. And, and the beauty of this is each player now can decide whether he wants to play and they're all doing this and, uh, and it's their call and they're taking advantage of the opportunity. And I'm thrilled for them that they're going to get a chance to, to perform and, and chase their dreams. It was interesting from my perspective, the last few weeks while we're waiting for the live games to begin, we put together this thing called the dream season where we, Replayed some classic games of the last 20, 25 years. And uh, we interviewed some guys, including including Chris, because we went back uh, to the uh, 1998 Purdue game when Drew Brees threw all those passes 
four of them went to Wisconsin players. It was a great Badger win. Uh, but more recently, uh, guys like Jonathan Taylor and Chris Orr, uh, what they wanted to talk about was how excited they are for these guys, that they get to play a season, uh, you know, for the seniors to have that run, for, but for everybody to be able to have the opportunity to play. So that, that means something when you have guys who are now in the NFL but the first thing they wanted to talk about is how happy they are for this year's group of Badgers that that they get to play. So um, that that was that was fun, fun to hear that from those guys. Uh, it'll be it will be different. There is no question. I can tell you, as someone who worked about two dozen Milwaukee Brewers games, half at Miller Park and then the other half when the team was on the road, we were broadcasting the game off of a set of television monitors. It's different. It's different for players to come out. Um, to an empty stadium. But once they, at least I can tell you this from the baseball perspective, and I would imagine as different as the sports are, what I'm about to say will translate from baseball to football. It's different when you either come out of the dugout or come out of the tunnel and onto the field like the Badgers will on Friday. But once the ball's in the air, you're playing. And these guys are, are, they have this theme, bring your own juice, BYOJ, bring your own enthusiasm. You can't feed off of 80,000 crazy fans like you know would be the case on a Friday home game uh, anytime, but especially homecoming week. But I think these guys are, are good at generating their own enthusiasm. They've had a, a little test drive here late last week where they pumped in some crowd noise during a night practice at Camp Randall. They had the marketing guys, Kevin Clunder and his staff, getting the music going. So it will, they, they will do some things. They'll be creative to, to make the atmosphere as good as possible. But again, just for, for these guys to be able to play, that that's what matters most. Because I think, who knows for sure how the year is going to unfold, but I do think these guys have a chance to be very, very good again. We're, I guess, spoiled as Badger fans where it seems like the worst thing we can say about a team, a Badger team, is they've got a chance. Um, I think this team can be really, really good, even without somebody like Jonathan Taylor, without Quintez Cephas, who was one of the best wide receivers in college football, without Zach Vaughn, who was All-American good at getting to the quarterback. There's always that next wave, and we wonder who's going to be that next guy or group of guys. Uh, I'm really eager to see this group of running backs. Nikia Watson, you saw him some last year. Garrett Groshek, a, a veteran guy, a senior who can do a little bit of everything. And, and a name that you might want to keep in mind here uh, Friday night and moving forward is Isaac Arendo, young man out of Indiana. You saw him late last year. He can fly. He was a sprint champ in high school in Indiana. I remember him in the uh, Minnesota game last year. They ran a little reverse on a kickoff, and uh, it, it went for a big, big return. Um, I think he, he's the kind of guy who could be that big play threat for them. Um, the quarterback question, um, I'm sure maybe one or two of you are interested in that. Um, first off, I, I wish Jack Cohn as speedy a recovery as possible. I, I felt gutted for him because he's really one of the team leaders. Uh, he gained a lot of respect with these guys, even going back a couple of years ago when he played in the pinstripe bowl. That was his fifth game, so he burned a redshirt year to do it. Um, it won him a lot of points in, in the locker room, and he has just grown from that night or from that day as a leader of this team and, and a really good quarterback. And ever since he got hurt in, in practice a couple of weeks ago, he's still, he's still there at practice every day, still in the meetings, giving Graham Mertz and Chase Wolf and Danny Vandenboom all the advice that uh, he thinks that, that can help them. Um, but you'll like Graham. You know, his his arm strength is terrific. Um, I think the mobility is good. But he's a, fr he's a redshirt freshman making his first college start. But I think he, he is a very, very gifted guy. And uh, I know Jack will do everything to, to help him along and knock on wood at some point, Jack can, can come back this season. But I think, um, I think you're going to enjoy watching, watching Graham Mertz. Chase Wolf can be a very exciting quarterback, young man out of Cincinnati. And uh, Danny Vandenboom, Van, Vandenboom, excuse me, the Vandenboom name. You guys remember his father, Matt, back in the early 80s, uh, one of the great defensive backs that this program has ever had. And uh, Danny comes from a great high school background, Kimberly, a, a great program. So I think the quarterback room is in pretty good shape. Um, 
defensively real quick, um, without Zach Baum, without Chris Orr, I still think this defense can be really good. The, uh, the front line defensively, um, I, I think can be outstanding with uh, guys like Keanu Benton, Isaiah Loudermilk, Garrett Rand. They've got some pretty decent depth up front. And uh, a young man who you, you're hearing about a little bit, <coughs> excuse me, um, but someone at uh, the coaching staff, they went to Hawaii to get him. So you must think he's, they must think he's pretty good. Uh, a name to keep in mind is Nick Herbig, uh, an outside linebacker. Um, I'm not going to make any grand predictions of what he could do this Friday night or a week from Saturday, but I think he can be an exciting outside linebacker for them. Um, there's a lot of experience, especially in the secondary. Uh, Jim Leonard's done a great job with his defense, been one of the top defenses in college football now over the past several years. So I think while the offense kind of finds its legs with some new faces in key spots, the defense can uh, can keep them very much in the fight week in and week out. Uh, they're playing an Illinois team, as Max said. Uh, maybe these guys owe them one. They're, uh, they made a jump last year. They went to a bowl game for the first time in five or six years. Lovey Smith, who was on the Badger staff, you remember him maybe going back to the late to the late 80s. He was here for a year, a uh, successful run in the NFL with, uh, with the Bears in Tampa Bay. They felt like they turned a corner last year, and they, uh, they created a lot of turnovers. That's the one thing that really, <coughs> excuse me, hurt Wisconsin in the game last year. Uh, they were one of the best turnover teams in the country. Um, so coaches will always tell you ball security is like job security. Um, it's a big factor when any team plays Illinois. So I think as, if you look for a few keys on Friday night, that certainly would be one of them. So look forward to it. I think you know we're all eager for Big Ten football. Uh, I think, you know, I, I don't know about you, but watching a lot of these other games across the country, it, it's not quite the same without the Big Ten. So I'm happy that, that this league gets to join the party this weekend. Well, thank you, Matt. Great remarks. I'm sure we'll get a lot of audience questions, but I'll throw out a couple to start. Um, Chris, can you tell us, um, you know, what has been the experience of the team with any, you know, outbreaks of COVID? Um, have we had players who've tested positive? And if so, you know, roughly how many? And do we feel like once you've had it, you can't get it again? Uh, what What's yeah. your take? It's a good question, Mike. You know, we've had um, over the course of the summer and uh, early this fall um, players that have uh, contract, contracted COVID. Um, thankfully, we have not had any cases that have resulted in in um, much severity uh, in terms of their symptoms or long lasting effects. Um, we feel pretty good about um, where we're at today. Um, and since we've been able to uh, put in place daily rapid turnaround testing, and really an incentive, um, an incentive to play, an incentive to make uh, good decisions, responsible decisions, be compliant with with guidelines. Um, you know, there's a carrot out there um, for our for our players. And if and it's not like it's 100% uh, in their control. Um, but you know, they like all of us, uh, they can minimize their chances of contracting COVID. And um, you know, the incentive is a pretty powerful one for them. They've been working, uh, most of them all their lives for this moment. And, um, it's been a pretty good, it's been a pretty good one. You know, the consequence, um, uh, per the protocol, uh, that the big 10 has put in place of contracting the, the disease during the season is a minimum of 21 days. And so, uh, on a, on an eight game regular season, that's a significant portion of the season that'll be missed. And, you know, our guys have been motivated by that. Um, they've done a good job uh, for for a while now of, of, um, of staying healthy. And, and really, I think they've taken it upon themselves to, to hold each other accountable. Um, it's, you know, we've, we've watched what's happened uh, in other college programs and in other leagues. And um, it's an unpredictable disease and it's a, it's a roster management nightmare uh, position by position. Um, and so I think our guys are, they're aware of that and they've done a good job of, of dealing, dealing with it, uh, as of late. Chris, can I just follow up on that? If a team had, let's say above a threshold number of cases, 
would they consider doing what the NFL has done with postponement and make games up, or do we not have any room to do that? Yeah, there's no, there's not room to do that, Mike. Um, you know, there's a strict uh, threshold. Um, you can think of it as a, as a, you know, a red, yellow, green type uh, approach. And um, you know, our players are aware of it. Um, we're we're green, ready to go. Um, I'm not aware of anybody in the league actually that's that's anything but green right now. And so, um, but there is not, you know, the way the schedule has played out. Um, with the postponement, there isn't the ability to, to reschedule a game for later in the year. And so that, that incentive to play the games uh, and make good decisions is, is out there. So I guess you just play with who you got. You play with who you got for sure. I mean, there is, there is a point in which, um, you know, I suppose you could exceed the metric or come close to exceeding the metric. And if it was concentrated on, on one position group, uh, it'd be problematic. So, that has been uh, considered by the league and by the coaches. And um, to the extent that it becomes a, a player safety issue, it'll be dealt with that way. Let's not focus on that. Let's not focus on that. This is, we're, we're going to talk about good stuff. Yeah. Matt, when you look at the schedule, which games do you have circled on the calendar for the Badgers that are really critical games? Um, All of them. I mean, they, they, it's a shortened season. I mean, I, that's a, that's a coach speak answer I just gave you. But uh, I think in a in a nine game season, eight games, and then the ninth game is part of what what they're calling Champions Week, which I, is just a brilliant idea. I think in a, in a season like this, where in addition to the Big Ten Championship game, everybody else plays. The second place team in the East plays the second place team in the West, three versus three, so on and so forth. Now, if it's a rematch then they might adjust that a little bit, but they get a kind of a final game championship feel. But when you're playing, when you're playing nine games, uh, I, I do think that magnifies everything. I mean, you know, even last year, let's, you know, let's be honest. We, we just talked about maybe getting a little payback with Illinois, Wisconsin, you know, the Badgers played 14 games, including the Rose bowl. And, and you know, one of those, they're the first loss of the year was against Illinois. And that was, that was a big hit you know, for a team that had some pretty high aspirations and obviously had a terrific year, a great year. Anytime you go to the Rose Bowl, that's a great year. But that was that was big now. So that gets magnified even more when you play a shortened schedule like this. So uh, th this first game, it's a division rival, a West Division team. So that puts more importance on it. Um, you know, to me, every, every year you circle Minnesota, right? Every year you circle Iowa. And those are the automatics. Um, but I, I just think with this year, and I think these players, they're smart kids. They know that. Um, you let your guard down in a given week, and it could, it could knock, you off your, uh, knock you off your path to, to where this team thinks it has a chance to get to. Yeah. I'm pressing a little harder on the pencil when I circle Minnesota now for obvious reasons that we don't have to talk about. Um, let's get outside of coach speak and talk about the Big Ten West. Who do you see coming out of the Big Ten West? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. Oddly enough, I like the Badgers. I think they've got they've got a got a great shot. I I do think um, our uh, our friends to the west of us uh, have a pretty have a pretty good little thing going uh, over there in Minnesota. So that that's going to be that, that it's a rivalry, right? So every game, it doesn't matter where where you are in the standings. That's always a, a big game. But I think. You know, they have an experienced quarterback. They have a very good receiver who originally had opted out. He has opted back in, so that, that makes Minnesota very dangerous. Iowa year in and year out. Um, but I, you know, um, I could say I'm biased, but I think the facts speak for themselves. The team that is the hunted in the West, the Badgers. Um, they're, they're the ones who have the bullseye, right? So until proven otherwise, the Badgers are the team to beat. And – Come, coming out of the East, your alma mater? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's interesting because, you know, Ryan Day, their, their head coach, was very vocal in the in the period of the postponement saying he, had, he thinks they might have a once-in-a-lifetime team. Uh, to be honest, I thought last year 
Uh, that was as impressive looking a Big Ten team as I've seen in more than 30 years of, of covering the Big Ten Conference. Um, it doesn't automatically mean you're going to win the title. They had a, a slip up in the semifinal round, but they were, again, kind of the same thing in that division, though, until proven otherwise. Ohio State is the team to beat. Penn State has a lot of talent. Um, you know, they've done a very good job there, Coach Franklin, over the years. Uh, Michigan, because it's Michigan, is always going to get a certain amount of attention. But Ohio, you know, Wisconsin in the West, Ohio State in the East, until somebody proves otherwise, those are the two best in their respective divisions. Mac, are we playing jump around? <laughs> I think we got to work a little jump around in. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It wouldn't be a game without it. <laughs> Players love right. it. They, they do. Fun. They do. They do. I, I you know. I mean, it'll be a great thing on TV, I guess. Hey, Mac, when they when they had the, the 98 game, the Purdue game, so you were there, you were a part of that. That was the first time they played jump around. Did you have any idea what was happening as that was being played? No, no, no clue. No clue. I mean, who could have predicted what that would become? Um, and who could have predicted what, what a home field advantage that would create? It, it was a complete, a complete distraction from that point on uh, for the defense and, or for whoever's on the field at that time, it was the their defense was on the field when it when it was first played, and um, I mean I'll never forget, you know, coming out of the we were coming out of the north end zone, heading south, uh, and we were you know maybe in the twenty five or thirty, uh, close enough to the student section when it happened, uh, and it and it caught it caught their attention, and and uh, you know we quickly realized that they weren't thinking about the next play. They were, they were admiring what was happening in the stadium, which is a great place to be. That was awesome. Great, place to be. great lesson there. <laughs> uh, question from Ron Luskin. Can you talk a bit about recruiting? And I think I'd, I'd, I'd ask you both to comment on that. Um, Ron remarks, it seems like we're getting, you know, kind of a higher rated uh, class coming in increasingly um is it the stability of the coaching staff or you know the 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 program having been good for so long what do you attribute that to i could take the first crack at it and then i'd love to hear matt's comments as well um you know i think um <laughs> recruiting during a covid era um has played well for wisconsin um and it, this is anecdotal observation on my part but I think it's largely because our coaches uh, have had to go back to an old school style of recruiting um, in-person visits, either uh, recruits to campus or our coaches out on the road uh, have been on hold since March. And, uh, you know, there's only so much uh, that can be done on social media and on Twitter and, and the like, and it's forced uh, recruits to get to know coaches and to get to know institutions like ours, the old fashioned way by talking on the phone and by building a relationship and getting to know each other and determining if there's a fit. Um, I'd put us up against anybody in that game. Uh, it speaks to the kind of people that we have on our staff. It speaks to their ability to um, communicate the feeling of being part of Wisconsin and this university, um, it's for many of them, it's it, they, they were students here themselves and, and uh, can speak to it. And um, that's one aspect of COVID uh, and the success we've had in recruiting. Uh, you're right, Ron, that we have had uh, some really talented classes come through. And that's one aspect of COVID that we'd like to prolong. Yeah, they've uh, to the to the star system, you know, they've been able to get and coaches will tell you they're you know, they're more interested in how their careers end and how many stars they have coming in. But that said, you know, Ronnie, your question: you get a guy like Jack Nelson, offensive lineman. His daddy was a Badger back uh, back in the mid to late '80s. Trey Wedig, a, a young man from the state, again very highly regarded offensive lineman. A lot of stars by those names: Logan Brown, young man from Michigan, a redshirt freshman. Um, he, too, has a lot of stars by his name. And, in, and at the same time, I talked to Ross Kalaji, the strength coach, who was a teammate of Max uh, with, with the Badgers back in the 90s. They, they've been able to, I think, improve the, in, in the area of speed. 
Um, you're going to, I think, enjoy another young player this season who looks like he's going to be in a position to help this team sooner than later is a young man from Waukesha named Chimray DK. He's a wide receiver. He's really impressed his teammates uh, in camp. Uh, Stephon Bracey, Richard Freshman from Michigan, guys who really run well. But to, to Max's point, and he can always speak to this far better than I, but just in, in talking with, with the coaches and, and with the current players, there is a culture that is built here. And you, always, you hear the, the term fits a lot, and it matters. Uh, they, of course, you have to be a very good athlete, but you have to be good socially. You have to be a fit academically. And as long as you stay true to that, and this staff has done that, then year in and year out, this team is going to have a chance to, to do great things. And that's, that's the really enjoyable part for me being around this program. It's a, it's a roster full of kids who get it. They just understand it. And they're eager to do things in the community virtually now, but uh, you know, obviously in person for years and years through the Badgers Give Back program. Uh, they understand what it means to be a Wisconsin Badger. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun a lot of fun to watch. And when you got guys like Jim Leonard and Joe Rudolph and Mickey Turner alums, guys who've been through the program and experienced great success, you have those guys who really understand how things work at Wisconsin. And then you get other uh, staff members who might be newer in some cases to the, to the program, to the university, but they get an idea in a hurry of how things work. So it's a great mix that they have going here. Staff stability certainly doesn't hurt, but they've just got a genuinely good group of talented coaches who recruit a good group of talented players. It's a, it's a thrill to watch. You know, Let me flip Matt, Ron. Oh, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, one, one other point on that, Matt. You know, so it occurred to me when you're describing the coaches, that same feel as it exists, understanding this place, being part of it, being bought in, as it, as it exists within our existing players one of the things that's changed over time is is the uh, the role that our current players our current roster plays in recruiting and it and it's it's the it's the leveraging of technology and it's the it's the language that they speak but there is there's a flywheel that's got momentum behind it right now and the coaches play a big role in that but but the players themselves and we'll talk about Graham Mertz but he was a he was a key uh, part of recruiting that class and those players that you just uh, mentioned. And, and it, mm. one thing for a coach to to try to convince a young a young person to come to Wisconsin and be part of something special, it's another when it comes from from their peer, or their future teammate. And that's been really that's been pivotal for us. You know, let me flip Ron's question on its head because what we've been known for for so long is developing walk-ons into all americans as well and of course jimmy leonard is a prime example how how do you explain that phenomenon at wisconsin is it truly you know a level different than other programs in the big 10 in that dimension and if so are we better at identifying the hidden gems that you know just weren't rated maybe because their high school was so small like jim leonard what scouts are even going out and rating you, or is it the player development? What What would you say to that, Chris? You know, I, I think Barry would say um, that it's changed. So, you know, back in the day, you had the ability, our program had the ability to recruit underdeveloped players from the upper Midwest, specifically Wisconsin, where um, youth football isn't as prominent and uh, there's a there's a tremendous amount of upside potential that hasn't yet been realized, um, and and we had success. I mean, the, you know, we, we can go through names; we'd be here all night. Um, now, though, to to borrow the same term I just used, it's a different flywheel with a different set of with a different level of momentum behind it because that's that same strategy exists today, and really. Um, one of the reasons that it's been so uh, effective is that walk-ons at Wisconsin are treated the same as scholarship athletes. They're, they're part of the team. They're a member of the team like anyone else. The expectation for them is the same as the scholarship athlete. There's no distinguishing between the two. That's part of the culture in the locker room at Wisconsin. 
But now I think we're able to attract a more talented uh, athlete that, that is willing to be a walk-on at Wisconsin. Um, Joe, Schor- Joe Schulbert's a great example. He's the first one that comes to mind. Turned down a scholarship offer uh, to be a walk-on at Wisconsin. Why? Because we have a track record of walk-ons at Wisconsin excelling, becoming All-Americans, and in his case, becoming Pro Bowlers. And that that's a snowball that's, that keeps getting bigger and bigger and rolling faster and faster. And it's, um, you know, your question, Mike, is anybody doing it uh, as well as we are? If they are, I'm not aware of it. It's, it's a cornerstone of our program. Great answer. Thank you. Uh, question from Ken Dale. Camp Randall is such a competitive advantage, especially at night. Is that going to be negated without fans? And what's the early evidence on, you know, what was traditionally a three-point home field advantage in the NFL, for example? Uh, what do we know about that? Matt, do you have any insight into that? Yeah, well, it's, uh, yeah, as far as how many points it's worth, you never really know. But I think you got to think it's been worth more than a few over the years, right, for the Badgers playing at Camp Randall. I know Barry always, you know, as a coach, he loved the big game, especially the big home game, the big home night game. Um, you, know, you get this time of year, it's a little crisp or maybe just a little cold, uh, but everybody gets wound up for, for a home game and, it, it gives the Badgers a few points. So that'll be, you know, that'll be something that'll be a challenge for, for the Badgers. It'll be a challenge for, you know, all the, all the big 10 teams that play in the historically loud venues. Um, you got to think it's, if it's not going to be totally wiped out, uh, it, it's going to, it's going to level it a little bit because you just, you don't have 80,000 people screaming in support of you, but there's still for the, the Badgers, Camp Randall, the familiar surroundings, uh, how the wind works, uh, how it swirls a little bit in, in the stadium, um, you know, little tricks like that that they'll be much more familiar with than the opposing team. But um, that's something that, that Wisconsin, that, that every Big Ten team is going to have to deal with this year. Yeah, you know, I, I, would, I would echo what Matt has said. Um, you know, the home field advantage – uh, will certainly be diminished without the energy that we're used to uh, with our fans. Um, but don't, you know, don't underestimate um, being able to prepare in your own locker room, your own training room, you know, that familiarity of, of your own facility. It's like your own home might be. Um, the other thing I wonder about, though, is, um, you know, the energy uh, that comes with playing in a hostile environment as the, as the visitor um, that, that plays into it as well. And, and, you know, there's, there have been great teams that have walked into uh, flat stadiums where it hasn't been a, a hostile environment and they've come out flat and, you know, say it kind of, it cuts both ways and it'll be interesting to see, especially first time through on, on Friday night, how each team responds to it. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because you know, Barry, he, he said it in any number of interviews, uh, especially after his coaching career was over he hated to go to a, a couple of road venues, although they'll stay nameless, a couple of road venues where the attendance was light because it just it didn't feel like, you know, he, he much preferred Warren and Mac and all those guys about, like, you go into Iowa and the fans are right on top of you. And, and you know, history shows, I think, in, in a lot of ways that the Badgers fared pretty well in some of those really hostile road environments. So that's a great point that, that Chris brings up. Again, I go back to the baseball conversation. You know, some of the Brewers guys said the same thing. Um, they kind of missed going into Wrigley Field and not hearing the cat calls from the, you know, the, the left field bleachers, the right field bleachers. There is a little give and take with that. So uh, it's, as Chris said, don't underestimate what that can mean to the visiting team too, not having the – the juice in the crowd, so to speak, that they normally have. So my next question is, why have we had trouble over the years at Northwestern? No, I, I never mind. Uh, <laughs> so um, I think the evidence on the NFL, according to Sagarin, is it's maybe like a point and a half less of an advantage. NFL, generally speaking, they think of three points. Maybe this year it's a point and a half so far is what it looks like. But who knows? You know, I think in a tight game especially – 
that crowd noise at the end when the opposing offense is trying to drive, that could be really important. So we'll have to put them away early. Um, Matt Ryan wonders, Matt, how much time do you spend each week in preparation for the game that you broadcast? And I want to say at the outset, you can't count the time you would have spent just because you love reading about football anyway. <laughs> Go ahead. You can count it up. You can count yeah, it I've, never, I've never counted the hours, but I guess it's a lot. Like I have, here's my chicken scratch board of, uh, of the Badgers. And I got the same thing for, for Illinois. I do it old school. The younger folks have it all, you know, have it all printed out for them. I still use the, the Sharpies and the highlighters and all of that. So you go through the roster, get as much bio information as is pertinent. Um, I've been looking back at the Illinois bowl game. They played at the Red Box Bowl against Cal. Justin Wilcox, head coach there, he was defensive coordinator here between Dave Aranda and now Jim Leonard. So it's a lot of that. Um, I'll, uh, I'll sneak a peek at practice, uh, distanced, of course, way away from any players. So, uh, and a lot of, you know, interview a handful of players every week, meet with Paul a couple times a week, um, two or three times a week, actually, and just gather enough information tomorrow afternoon. I'm going to have a chat with my counterpart at Illinois. We're not giving away any, state secrets, obviously, um, because we only know enough to be dangerous anyway. But just a little back and forth. He'll fill me in on, on the Illini. I'll fill him in a little bit on the Badgers, uh, what's been making news here. So um, it, it's a fair amount of hours, but it beats working. <laughs> I'm talking a lot today. Don't be concerned by my cough, by the way. It's just from excess talking here today. Mac. How are we feeling about our other sports teams that are about to swing into action? Can you give us a few thoughts about, uh, you know, highlights around the around the building uh, in the athletic department? I can. Um, you know, both our basketball teams, our men's and women's basketball team, and our men's and women's hockey team uh, are underway now in in the in their preseason phase. Um, that started uh, last week, Wednesday. Um, you know, just to jump right to it, and and, and Matt can elaborate. Um, but you know, there's a lot of excitement around those teams, and there's certainly a lot of excitement around our men's basketball team after after their finish last year, and the, and the amount of uh, players that they have returning, and and you know, a season that um, it ended on a high note uh, with the regular season conference championship, but but you know, stopped short of the of the big 10 tournament and, and March madness. And, and I think that left them as hungry as ever uh, to, you know, to prove to people that, that they're, they're legit. They're a force to be reckoned with. And, and um, you know, this off season uh, for them has been as crazy as it has been for everyone uh, for football. Uh, like I mentioned at the top of the show, um, but you know, you got a gritty group of, of young men that, uh, you know, have enough talent and and some young talent, some new young talent uh, coming in that, and and they have that that magic ingredient, which is confidence. Uh, I mean, they they believe they can play with anybody, and uh, so there's a lot of excitement. Um, you know, that season, it's it's uh, it feels good that it's it's about to be underway. Um, it seemed like it was on the back burner as. You know, we went through the whole summer of trying to figure out how we were going to get anything done, how we we're going to get football started. And, uh, you know, it's it's one more step towards, you know, business as usual uh, within our buildings. And, and it, that's uh, that's refreshing. It was um... and volleyball. When when do they put it in play? Yeah, volleyball, volleyball will shift to the spring season. So so they're they're in a. A mode of, of practice right now and, and off-season training camp, but but there's another team that's just laden with talent, um, and they are they are chopping at the bit uh, to take it out on <laughs> take it out. Of Chris and Matt, Mike, I, I would chime in with with basketball. I've been lucky enough to be around the, the program now for. 30 plus years, I guess now, um, you, you see, I've been blessed to see a lot of remarkable players, remarkable seasons. I mean, three final fours. And, and I thought in a lot of ways, what I witnessed with this 
Badger basketball team last year was as remarkable a thing as I've ever seen. You consider everything that these guys had to deal with going back to, to Coach Moore and the terrible accidents in, in May of 2019 um, to obviously things that happened during the course of the season, and they were struggling. They were a very inconsistent team. And you know, there was reason to be worried that this was could be another year where they, they don't win enough games to be tournament worthy and, and a team that wasn't going to be any kind of a threat to win the Big Ten. And for me, it's just maybe part of the Badger magic that their their run and the winning streak started on a day where they honored the 2000 Final Four team of Dick Bennett, which up until last season, I thought that was the most remarkable thing I'd ever seen. Uh, that group of guys with not one player who was even honorable mention all Big Ten, and yet they end up playing on the biggest stage in college basketball going to the Final Four. But I think given all that the, the guys last year uh, had thrown at them and to win a piece of the Big Ten championship and would have been the number one seed in the Big Ten tournament and probably a high seed in the NCAA tournament, that was – I haven't seen anything more impressive with a group of Wisconsin basketball players than what I saw last year. And I'm, I'm excited for what this year can bring with the experience, as Max said, a ton of experience back and a pretty sizable and talented recruiting class coming in. Nothing's guaranteed, but uh, I am excited to see what this group can do. Did we lose you, Mike? You can't get rid of me that easy. <laughs> okay. Um, I might have to say you guys will have to take I think it from it's you, Matt. I, can't, I, uh, I lost Mike's audio. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure what to make of the, of the video. <laughs> I, I, think it's, I think it's you and me doing a little filibustering. I, apparently, yeah. We'll, we'll throw some time. It's like all of a sudden we're in a movie. It's like <laughs> October surprise. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So, Matt, go back to your college days. Uh, this is the group. They've got to, they go to practice. They take their classes, probably mostly online, and then they're, they're at home. They don't go out at all. How would Chris McIntosh have handled that if this was going on in 1998 or 99? In all seriousness, um, <laughs> you know, I couldn't be more proud of the way our players, our student athletes across the board have, have handled the situation. Um Admittedly, I'm not sure uh, the 19 year old version of me would have been able to do so with as much maturity and, and grace uh, as they have um, for all kinds of reasons. I, I think, you know, um, this challenge has brought out the best in our staff and uh, our coaches and in, in our student athletes. And, um, you know, it, it would be human nature that that they get upset or even angry, you know, the basketball, you know, the basketball example, the men's basketball team is a great example, a team that's rolling into the big 10 tournament with, with all the momentum you could ask for. Um, and it's just cut short and it, it would be easy uh, for them to be resentful or even angry about it. And, you know, what was, what could have gone that way was met with, uh, you know, a really mature, responsible approach. I think, I think our, our Badger family understood um, that there's a bigger picture here and, and that we play a role in, in the health of our communities. And, uh, you know, like I said at the top of the show, that's something to be proud of. I think that that's, uh, you know, illustrative of the kind of uh, people that work, you know, for the Badgers and that play for the Badgers. And um, I, I don't know. I, I don't know that I would have been able to, to approach it with that level of maturity when I was when I was that age. So I, I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, you know, it's very, really impressive what these guys are doing. I uh, I don't know if Mike is back up or not, but I've got a got a question from Sarah. I think <laughs> I sure what I'm not sure what Mike's doing back there. Um, Mac, uh, do you have any sense of what the postseason and bowl games what it looks like and and about how? How the folks in the college football playoff committee, I know you're not on it, but how would how do you anticipate they're going to judge with leagues with different number of games? Yeah, so, you know, to, to tackle the bowl game question first, um, there's a lot of talk about bowl games. Um, the bowl games, uh, you know, the, our league has been 
uh, and constant communication with the different bowl partners. Um, there's a lot of optimism that the bowl games uh, will take place. Um, uh, it'll certainly be different. Um, fans, no fans. So much is dependent upon, you know, the state of the of the local market uh, that the bowl resides in. But uh, as of right now, there's a lot of optimism about the ability to play bowl games. I, I think, um, you know, one thing that we've all been reminded of is, uh, you know, there's not there's not a lot of uh, confidence in, in long term predictions. And um, I know, you know, on the calendar, it doesn't seem far away. But uh, right now, you know, a bowl game that's uh, got nine games to play between now and then seems like an eternity away. Um, <laughs> the short answer is uh, we're planning on playing them and they're planning on hosting them. Most likely it'll be modified. Uh, it won't be like it. It has been in the past, uh, you know, our uh, our medical folks and, and our task force at the Big Ten is everything gets run through them right now uh, to make sure that it's in the best interest of our of our players. Uh, and so, you know, that might mean shorter trips, uh, certainly modified experience for student athletes. But, you know, even with that, um, don't underestimate, you know, the motivation uh, that playing in a venue, and I'll just go back to uh, one like the Rose Bowl, just because it's it's still uh, fresh on our minds. You know, don't even without that week long experience, don't underestimate uh, the motivating the motivating factor that that is. Um, and to be able to showcase the Big Ten in our program against against others in college football that we wouldn't usually play on a, a regular basis, uh, it's a huge opportunity. And it's, those are the kind of games that that players come here to play in regarding the CFP, your bet is as good as mine. Right. <laughs> the criteria, uh, you know, will be need to be a modified one. There's a lot of talk about that in, you know, in this era that we live in with the, you know, the on the data and the metrics and the scrutiny of which one, uh, you know, should be weighted the heaviest. Um, it's going to be a tough year. And I, I think you throw out the window, what, what you've relied on in the past and, and, um, you know, you get down to, you know, the basics of what makes a team better than the others. There's going to be a lot of, there will be a lot of controversy. I, I would assume or predict a uh, number of wins and number of games versus number of games played. And, uh, this is just going to be one of those years where, you know, uh, controversy on, on who's the best in college football exists, but why should this year be any different than any other, I suppose. Uh, real uh, one more question, and then we can go ahead and have some have you with a closing remark. But Bill wants to know uh, the the Notre Dame game obviously was highly anticipated at Lambeau, and I know they're gonna the teams are gonna play in Chicago next year. Is there any update on a possible rescheduling of the of the Lambeau game with Notre Dame? Yeah, th there's no update uh, with any level of specificity attached to it, other than just to say you know th there's an intent by both schools to, to reschedule that game. I think we got close enough to that game to, to, to taste it and to understand how special that would have been. Um, both schools have a desire to, to reschedule that game. Um, you know, putting together a schedule at, at one school versus Matt lining them up in short order um, is going to, it's going to need a lot. There's going to be a need to move around games and, and, uh, and talk about different contracts with other games to try to, to try to do that. So it's, it's a mess. Um, but there's a strong desire on both our parts to get it done. Uh, and, and, you know, next year will be, it, it'll be, it'll be special next year uh, for sure. And we look forward, to, we're glad to be able to play it, especially on the heels of when we were supposed to play it this year, but you know, that, that Lambo experience and, and we all remember what it was like the last time we were there against LSU. Um, you know, this had the makings of, of that kind of a night. And um, that's hard to see just kind of slip through our fingers, given everything else that's happened. I'm going to use the remaining time here. We thank, uh, we thank all of you for, for joining us here tonight. Mike has gone off into the Wisconsin night somewhere, but uh, the remaining time, Mac, I just kind of open the floor. Are you, are you there? There he is, sort of <laughs> deep into the night. Mike Canetter, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Mac, anything finally you want to you want to say to everybody here as we get ready for for the first game, first game of the year? Yeah, you know, 
I want to just say thank you. Uh, thank you to our fans uh, and for the support that you've given us. Um, it's been an incredibly wild ride uh, since March. And there's been a lot written about the seasons and about uh, you know the financial health of our department and the challenge that we face. And you know we've been met with nothing but support from our fan base and from our alums. And um, I just want to say, take this opportunity to say thank you for that. You've been here for us for a long time and um, you're here for us now in a time when, when we really need your support in all kinds of uh, fashions. And, and uh, you know, right now, our athletes uh, competing in front of an empty stadium, uh, it's going to be different, that's for sure, but, but they need your support now more than ever as well. And uh, we're excited about Friday night. We're excited to celebrate uh, the kickoff to a, what could be a great season. We've got a great team. Um, there's a lot of excitement in, in our facility right now and in Camp Randall, and, and you should be excited and proud of, um, of the kids that we have playing for us right now. So yeah. thank you again in, on Wisconsin. Yeah, well, well said. Uh, thank, thanks to all of you for, for joining us here tonight. Uh, I, I'm so, so thrilled that these guys get a chance to, to play on Friday against Illinois. So uh, it, it's going to be a lot of fun to watch these guys. You're going to enjoy watching this team. They've got good veteran talent, a lot of exciting young players. And uh, you brag on Mac and, and Barry as well for, for what they've – what they've done uh, to do their part to help bring football back. Uh, I can only try to imagine what the daily zoom call schedule has been like for, for you, Mac and, and for Barry. Um, but I'm glad uh, I'll be glad for all of you when the ball's in the air and you can allow yourself to exhale to get through game one and then do everything that you can to, to get through game two. But uh, It's going to be fun. It's going to be another great year of Badger football and uh, it's exciting to get it started. So, Thanks to all of you for joining us uh, here tonight. Thanks to Mike Kinetter, wherever he may be, parts unknown. Enjoy the game. Have a great week on Wisconsin. Good night.